In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and it shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, never joyous in his consolation, to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. A Lady Fatima. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Father Lent Terry. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you all to our Ignatian Forum and we welcome you to this very holy time of the year. We're in Holy Week. But the very heart of Holy Week is the Easter Triduum. So we've already entered into the Easter Triduum, which is, uh, Triduum means three, three days in preparation for the greatest of all solemnities, which is Easter. Easter Triduum consists of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. And then we celebrate the the Solemnity of Easter. And each one of these days is uh, of great importance. So today being Holy Thursday, we'll talk about Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday. There's no morning Mass today. But there's the evening Mass, which is uh, a beautiful Mass. It's a Mass in which um, there's the washing of the feet. We actually have that right here. Jesus is washing the feet of, uh, of Peter. Huh? Very appropriate, isn't it? Yes, it is. And then he'll be washing, washes the feet of the twelve apostles. And we have, of course, the celebration of the Mass, and the high point is consecration, and then communion. And after that, we would there's the transference of the Blessed Sacrament to another place where people are invited to come to spend time with the Lord. And that symbolizes the, the Last Supper moving to the Garden of Gethsemane and accompanying our Lord in his, his agony. So it's a transition from this moment of great joy into our Lord's passion. So the Last Supper, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Did you know at the Last Supper, we've got... We've got the institution narrative in the synoptics, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which they recount uh, what our Lord actually did at the Last Supper. Whereas St. John does not have the, the account of the Last Supper, Last Supper in the sense of our Lord instituting the Eucharist. The others have the institution of the Eucharist. However, in the Gospel of John, there's actually five chapters in the Last Supper, of the Last Supper. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yes, which would be John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Those five chapters. You know what it's called? It's called the Last Supper Discourse. In Sinai Jesu, Jesus uh, recommends that the priests read those chapters and meditate upon them frequently. So John 13, you have the washing of the feet. So, Holy Thursday. Mr. Eric Files, what does Holy Thursday mean to you? Well, Father, I'll select the microphone and the, um, well, <laughs> what's been on my mind lately, uh, thanks to a certain priest, Father Ed Broom, oh. uh, <laughs> has been catechizing 
many different groups of people, which I have been a part of, and uh, it has helped me to really want to go deeper into the um, the institution of the Holy Eucharist, the very first celebration of the Holy Mass by the highest priest, the high priest, Jesus Christ, Good point. Yeah. the first priest, and then conferring the priesthood on to the apostles and then all the other priests, including yourself, mm -hmm. for time immemorial. And there, it is just so rich. It's really beyond, under my, I believe it's beyond human understanding the way that um, this was all done but uh, to me, that's, you've, you know, you've taught us, Father, the most important gesture in our life is receiving the Holy Eucharist. And then we have to have priests. No priests, no Mass. No Mass, no consecration, no consecration, no Eucharist. No Eucharist, we are spiritual orphans. Well, I've heard that before. <laughs> yes, but it's true. And just the way... Um, that it was that Jesus did everything you mentioned beginning with the washing of the feet everything is just there's so much symbolism in all of that uh, and yesterday um, Father Larry was talking about he was talking about the passion and he was talking about how you know there's theological uh, you know discussions about well God could have redeemed us in any way you know they could have like you've mentioned before he could have picked up a splinter in the in the in the wood shop saint saint joseph and it could have that gesture but uh something i had never really i mean it, it, it's i think it's obviously self-evident is that the way that he redeemed us is the best way it's the perfect way and jesus did everything perfectly as you're holding up that statue of Jesus washing the feet of Peter, every gesture that Jesus did was absolutely perfect in the whole sequence of events uh, of, of what happened at the Last Supper and then culminating with the um, Jesus giving himself as part of the meal, as the meal at the Last Supper and the multiplication of the Eucharist as it goes on forever uh, during time. I mean, it's a, it's a continuation of that uh, first sacrifice of the Mass. So it's, it's something that uh, you can ponder. And you see, you, I think God has given us the, the ability to see the solemnity and the beauty of what he, he did. And the more we go, the, I think the deeper we go, the more, if we're interested, I think the more he'll give us in terms of um, being able to, um, as we look at something so beautiful, to see, um, you know, his, um, his handiwork in our redemption. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that, Mary? I'm sure you have some deep insights. That was very beautiful, very beautiful. And the talk you gave last night was very beautiful, to talk at St. Therese. So mm -hmm. um, we are dealing with very um, <clears throat> sublime, sublime topics right now. Um, so it's recently in my spiritual life, I've had a lot of, dry, I've had dryness. So my, my, my contemplations, my meditations have become very simplified. And uh, what, I, what I really um, drew from preparing for today is two points. And one is um, that Jesus um, gives himself to us, the Eucharist. That is Jesus' presence among us. So we're, and unless we eat, this, eat his flesh and drink his blood, we will not have life within us. So daily I need to go to the Eucharist, and I'm able to. Some cannot, but make a spiritual communion. Make a spiritual communion. That's showing, your des uh, showing our desire for him, even though we can't physically be present. I'm graced to be able to be physically present. I live next door to the church. I'm an, I live under the shadow of the Blessed Sacrament, so I can receive him daily, and that's my daily bread. 
and by that um, I'm nourished, and by that I, my, I, um, I'm, I'm united with, with him. The second point that is important to me is the washing of the feet, because he got down on his hands and knees and washed their feet, and they were, that was the job of a slave. And it reminds me that my work is to get down on my hands and knees and wash the feet of whoever he brings in front of me, no matter who it is. And that's my neighbor, that's my brother, that's my sister. And in any way I can serve, it doesn't matter what I do. In one sense, at the, at the parish, my job here is, I, I call it, I'm a utility person. I can fill in because I have the most availability. I don't have, I don't have, I don't answer to anyone at home. I don't have anyone living at home with me. So I have total, and I'm not, I'm not working except with the church, so I have total availability mm. to do whatever needs to be done, and it doesn't matter what it is. If there's something that I can fill in and, and fill in a gap, then I do that to, my, to, to the best to the extent that I can. So in that sense, I feel that availability is, some, is a little bit of washing the feet because it's saying, wherever you need me, put me. It doesn't matter what I do, all right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. It's just, where do you need me? But also, um, I think all of us, with, our, with those persons we meet, so one is the job we do, the work we do, just availability to do whatever needs to, to see where the need is, wherever we are in our life, and try and fill it if, if we can. The second point is then the people that are in our daily life, that we encounter in our daily life, that I will wash their feet. And how do I do that? By, by greeting them, by smiling at them, by saying hello to them. Um, sometimes passing through the parish, that's all I have time to do, but I try and greet everyone I see coming and going through the parish, walking through it. Um, also to be available um, to, uh, to, to, needs, to their needs of the people, like if, if my family needs, someone needs to talk to me, or if I'm doing spiritual direction, just to be available to people where I'm where I'm called to be available, and whatever their needs are, and to see every person as my brother, my sister, and even just going to McDonald's and picking up some coffee and coming back, I I can smile at the people. I can smile at the people I'm working with, aware that's my brother and sister. So see how small my my contribution is, just little small ways that through my day I contribute being there for my brother and sister because I recognize them as my brother and sister in whatever way and that I'm available, I can. And the other way then is by being present to Jesus in the Eucharist every day and receiving him with great, just with this great love as I'm able to. So it's become very simplified. But it's, it's living, to me, it's living in Christ, with Christ, for Christ, through Christ in the, in the only way that he allows me to do in my simplicity. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> both of you are focusing a lot upon the Last Supper and what happened there. You mentioned the washing of feet, which is uh, symbolic of great humility and as well as uh, service. I see it also symbolic of, symbolic of confession because he had to wash the feet of the dirt and that's really what happens when you go to confession is the interior moral um, dirt in our soul is washed clean, not by water, but the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So it's, I see, often I'll see things symbolically and um, I'll try to, try to glean or derive the fruit that's present in that hidden kernel, you might say. Okay, why don't we um, spend some time on the Eucharist and, um, I wouldn't mind if we could spend a few minutes maybe taking a catechetical route, uh, catechizing a little bit on the Eucharist. Uh, I don't think we can ever go wrong in that. Um, what are ways, uh, why don't we do it this way? We, we can all, um, I have I have a quite, a few, quite a few on my mind, but why don't we, we can just, um, go around the table, so to speak, ways in which we can augment to fortify our devotion to the Eucharist. So I'll start. In my um, 
perseverance class this morning. This is one I mentioned five different points, but I'll mention one of them now. I would suggest uh, that all of us, not that it has to be done today, but I think it would be a good idea within the next three days maybe to do this, to read John chapter 6, the last 50 verses. John chapter 6, is it's a long chapter, it's 71 verses altogether. In John chapter 6 you have the Gospel of John is known as the Gospel of Signs. And sign for John means uh, miracles. There are actually seven um, prominent miracles that are carried out in the Gospel of John. And uh, John chapter 6, you actually have two back to back, which would be the, <clears throat> the multiplication of loaves, and then you have Jesus walks on the water. Then it's around the early... I think in verse 22, 23, Jesus is found in the um, the town of Capernaum, and he's there in the synagogue, and he gives this brilliant discourse. It's called the Bread of Life, Life Discourse, in which he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up on last day. So to augment our, our, our faith, devotion, love to the Eucharist, if prayer, we can prayerfully meditate upon that brilliant discourse of our Lord, uh, if it's done with um, sincerity, purity of heart, openness to the Holy Spirit, the net result of that is there's going to be a growth, I think, in, in the belief of the bread of life, which is the Eucharist, and that's going to be fortifying our our belief in the Eucharist. You know, I think one of the reasons why people uh, they 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 distance themselves from the church is because of a lot of ignorance. It's just a, a lot of ignorance, uh, lack a lack of a even a, just a solid foundational cate catechetical formation. Um, so, say you're. You, you spend time reading through John chapter 6 and it becomes, so to speak, a part of your part of your mind, part of your memory, part of your understanding. And then it, through meditation, it sinks down from your intellect into your will and it becomes part of your heart. I know, I know you can get up and leave the church, but I think that that's a really good safeguard. Because you have, you have that biblical passage which is embedded in your mind and is sunk into your heart. Of course, you know, everything is possible. You can jettison you know, precious cargo if you want. But uh, this is the most precious cargo, so to speak, we have because it's God himself. So this is an Ignatian form. And a lot, is, a lot of our work it depends upon getting people to do a serious prayer, we call that meditation. Meditation is translated into the daily holy hour. So that's one, the first thing I'd like to man mention is spend some time reading, meditating, John chapter 6. It's the early verse, like verse 22 all the way to verse 71, 50 verses. And, but the essence of that is, that is a Eucharistic prophecy of the Last Supper. You know, you're not the last supper yet, but Jesus is disposing his disciples, even us, to sit down at the last supper and see him breaking bread and and um, blessing wine and turn that bread and wine into his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So that's my point, my first point, Eric. Would you like to add to that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Father, you started out with the really, I think, one of the best ways to so. fortify ourselves. And just uh, for me, the um, John 6 is, uh, it really has helped me to understand and to know that there is no option, that we must do our best to uh, receive him in the Holy Eucharist. Because if we don't, by his own words, we have no life within us. And he also said if we do, then 
um, he will raise us on the last day. And we will have life within us. So the proposition not to uh, to receive Holy Communion is, it's not, you know, for Catholics, it really isn't an option. Um, but also what comes to mind, too, is the context of, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, um, you know, in John 6, I mean, after that, after he made that, uh, declaration it says like seven times six or seven times very clear that um you know that uh that it's his body and blood and soul and divinity and it's uh, that we have to receive it and that we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood and a lot of people were horrified but um what you mentioned is that we have the context of the bread of life discourse and other things that Jesus said in Scripture, and we have the um, benefit of understanding or being able to see what he was talking about so that it is something that isn't something that is going to um, frighten us away. It's, it's the opposite. He's humbled himself by uh, taking uh, the form of bread and wine, uh, and he's made himself available to us in such a non-threatening way. And so something that also came to mind um, that was in, we, we went over John 17 last week, uh, was the end of the bread of life discourse where Jesus is talking about how he is in the Father and the Father is in him, and he's praying and he wants he's praying for us that we should be um within them and the, within them and they should they would be within us as they are united for us to be united as well but there was something that i had really never noticed which is how he jesus articulated what his great how much of a great desire he has to be within us and and for him for, you know to me that just really helped me we know about the devotion to his sacred heart and how much he's, he, he always is communicating the intensity of his love for us. And um, he told St. Faustina to um, meditate on the, the immensity of his passion. But it is just, it, it's, it's really, it's overwhelming once we listen to his words, um, to see his, um, just his, to me, it's his great desire to live within us. And we know that if we're in the state of sanctifying grace, that Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit are living within us. They're dwelling within us. And that is their great desire, because every desire that Jesus has, the intense desire that Jesus has, so does the Father and so does the Holy Spirit. And that's very consoling to me. And how can we turn? How can we turn him away? And this is the time of year where we can contemplate what he went through, and to try to console him for what he did for us. Beautiful. Very obvious that uh, both of you have meditated frequently upon these uh, very sublime truths of the Eucharist, the Bread of Life Discourse, what happened at the Last Supper. And um, that obviously motivates uh, you and a lot of our Facebook family to, um, to, uh, to go to daily Mass and to be able to receive the Eucharist as frequently as possible. So we're trying to, today we're talking about the Easter Triduum, we're talking especially about um, Holy Thursday and our focal point right now is we're trying to augment our our, our faith and our, our love and our devotion to the Eucharist. And as um, I've said more than once, the greatest gesture that we can do this side of eternity is to go to Mass and receive the Eucharist. There's no greater gesture because that, that, that's when we actually receive God in ourselves. I call the Eucharist is like a bridge between heaven and earth, a bridge between time and eternity, the Eucharist. What do you think, Mary? Well, 
yesterday we were talking, um, or two days ago we were talking about this somewhat, and uh, I had mentioned that really the focal point in my life was uh, the Eucharist and confession, because I need confession to keep going to the Eucharist, uh, and also I need confession because um, even if I haven't committed a mortal sin, it cleanses my soul, and it it's preventative, it's curative and preventative, and I need that preventative medicine so that my heart can be more pure and a more clear pain to be able to, pain of glass, to see Jesus through and recognize him and to receive him more worthily in Holy Communion. And you ended by asking, you ended by saying, you didn't say anything about Mary. <laughs> Do you know I prayed for that for two days? Mother Mary, I, I walk with you every day. I, I live with you every day. Jesus told me in meditations, but years ago I've talked about this in this forum, he told me to stay with Mary. And at first I was disappointed. No, I want to go with Jesus like, like, the, like the boys. I want, to go, I want to go with boys to, with Jesus, okay? I want to go with the apostles. And, she, and Jesus said, no, you stay with Mary. So um, I live with Mary. But Mary always turns me to Jesus. That she turns all of us to Jesus. Her, her, she's, she's the... She moves us, the mother moves us to Jesus. And um, I'm conscious of that when we're talking about this topic about that, um, like you said, Eric, you're, you're such an awe that, that Jesus loves you so deeply, wants your love so deeply. And that's what Mother Mary is showing us. Um, it made me think about why I was created. And I'm in a point in my life where, lit, t sort of technically, nobody needs me. I mean, I'm not raising children. I'm not raising grandchildren. I don't have a spouse. I mean, I'm kind of a you know free-floating person. But that's there can be a sense there of nobody needs me, you know, or I'm not, you know, I'm not part of anything. So, um, and I think there's maybe some other people listening that that have that same experience. But it brings me all the more to the point that God created me out of love because he desired me to be with him for all eternity. We look around the world and say, well, who needs me? I mean, everyone has their lives, they're busy, I can connect with my family here and there, but I'm really not part of it. And Jesus is saying, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is saying, I need you. I created you to be with me for all eternity. And that starts here. That starts here. We, I am stepping into eternity when I turn to him and let him love me, receive his love, and return his love. And I return it. He said, but you can't come and be with me now. I said, well, let me just come home now. And he goes, no, you have to bring others with you. I, you're on earth to bring others with you. So you need to love others as I love them so that they will know my love. And then we, all your brothers and sisters will all come to heaven together. So it's not alone. We don't go to God alone. We always bring all of our brothers and sisters together with us to heaven. And I'm here as long as he wants me here to do that. That's my job, to bring as many people as I can with me to heaven and be brothers and sisters in heaven together, but to know his love now. And what you said, Eric, I hope all of us experience, I hope all our faith family experience the immense and intense love that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have for us. They love the idea of us, the idea of you so much, the idea of me so much, that he had to create me. And with God, to have an idea, it's, it's already created. So the idea of us, we, we, were, we were created. So not... We were, we were made to be loved by him and to love him. And that's why I go to the Eucharist every day, because that's who loves me. And that's why I turn to Mary, and she says, go to Jesus, go to Jesus in Eucharist, go to Jesus in confession. So this whole topic is about how much God loves us. And are we going to receive that love? Know that we're loved deeply, but more than anyone else can love us, and then help our brothers and sisters know that. Vatican II has um, a very important document, Lumen Gentium, uh, eight chapters. And the uh, fifth chapter of Lumen Gentium is the universal call to holiness. You mentioned um, we're called to be loved by God and we're called to love others. It's like a, a two-way street. Um, I think I, I, I think I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention as another um, means by which we live out the Eucharist would be to to go to Mass and to receive the Eucharist. Maybe that's common sense, but that has to be said. 
In a certain sense, the John chapter 6 that they talk about is, um, you might call it the, um, the gate by, gateway by which we arrive at understanding what, what, what the Eucharist is. It is the bread of life. And that should motivate us to want to, to go to Mass. And if, uh, if some of you are not going to Mass, now is the time to get back to Mass. Uh, this is the time to get back to Mass, making a good sacrament of confession. But then Mass, um, probably the verse that I quote most from Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the liturgy on the Eucharist. It's uh, it's funny how you you read through do certain documents and some some um, some of the uh, the ideas you read them you understand them and but then they kind of skip your mind. But this one has been with me for for decades. And Vatican II Sacrosanctum Concilium says that when we are in Mass, we should participate fully, actively, and consciously. That's the verse that jumps out most for me. Uh, of course, the document in it, in of its in and of itself is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's a sublime document. Understand the Mass and the the whole liturgy as a whole, liturgy of the hours. But uh, but uh, the heart of the heart of that document is the importance of Mass. But you know, in, in Mass, there's different dispositions. You can have, you could have, uh, in Mass you have people participating in Mass, but you have statues there too, right? <laughs> statues are there, right? You mean, you mean people statues? Yeah, I would say, I would say both. <laughs> That's uh, you giving a more extensive interpretation of that plan, but I guess your interpretation is a good one, no? Yeah, people, yeah, people are, sometimes they are like statues, they're just, they're present there physically, but mentally and spiritually they're in, uh, they're in another world. Um, so, just being in church is not enough. Jesus says this, when the Son of Man comes, many will say, well, Lord, I, I was with you. I heard you speak. I saw you carry out miracles. And Jesus will say, I did not know you. Get out of my presence. Those are strong words. They are. And I see that that could apply to Mass. You mean you could have someone going to Mass, but they're going to Mass, they're, they've got their their cell phone, they're not paying attention, they may be talking in Mass, maybe chewing gum, maybe checking out the girls, I mean all these things that are happening. So almost almost it would be better if they weren't in Mass because they're just a distraction for the other people and really they're they're offending God by not by not giving undivided attention. And you think about that. The Mass is a dialogue between the people of God and God Himself. It's a dialogue. And a dialogue means it's a it's a conversation in which we're mutually expressing ideas. It's a dialogue. A monologue is just talking and there's it's just a one way street. You're blurting out ideas but there's no response. What we have what we're having right now in the Ignatian form, it's it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue. We hope, hope we hope that our Facebook family, you people, are, are are being drawn into this dialogue, and maybe even you're talking with your family members as you hear us dialoguing. But um, like, if you marry Eric, you know you're talking, and I'm kind of zoning out and not paying attention to what you're saying. Uh, that's excuse me, that's bad manners. Right? It's bad manners. Yeah. It's, it's you know it's not uh, it's a lack of charity too. Bad manners, lack of charity. So on a human level, you know, we can get distracted. Maybe we didn't have a good night's rest, and we could we can get distracted. It's one thing, but purposely to zone out when someone is talking to you. It's uh, 
it's it's rude, but also it's a lack of charity. As if I'm not showing, by the way, I'm not paying attention to you. I'm not showing you the respect that you and the dignity you have as a human person. Now try to transfer that to mass when people are purposely not paying t- paying attention to what's going on mass. Objectively, it's more serious. Objectively. Because if you talk and I look at my watch and I scratch my nose and I yawn, that's, that's rude. Or I, put up my, I pull up my cell phone, you're talking to me, I, I decide I'm going to make a phone call when you're talking to me. That's rude. It's a lot of charity, too. But if we do it in church, we're, sm- we're snubbing God himself. Sure, you know, you never heard anyone speak this manner, but I think what I'm saying is the truth, right? Isn't isn't a massive dialogue between yes. the people of God and God himself? And the priest represents Christ, right? And this is the day of the priesthood, too. The priest, alter Christus, is a capo, as they say in Latin, the, the head of the church, the head of the assembly is the priest. And... Um, to be very honest with you, I find celebrating Mass today, I love Mass, and it will always be the center of my Mass, and um, one of you were mentioning um, when Pius XII, there was a world war going on, asked Cardinal Montini, what would you do if the war broke out, and he, would, he said, one of you said he would still, he would still celebrate Mass, no? Uh, I think it was you, Mary, that said that that he would stay. I'd still celebrate. Was it, ma- it was you. Oh, well, well, someone so said it. Maybe it, maybe it was. It. Maybe it was another person. Another dialogue we had, but he was. He said he would still celebrate mass, even though a war broke out. And Pius XII said that's that's a good, very good response. And Montini is going to be Paul the Sixth, no? But uh, we, we have to. We have to keep cultivating and trying to enhance our mass celebrations. We have to, we have to work at that. Um, it's true that people will, will bring their cell phone in because they want to follow the readings. That, that's okay. But um, you know, having the cell phone go off, that, I, I think very rarely now do I ever, ever celebrate the mass in which it doesn't go off at least once. And it is a disturbance, I have to admit. It, it, I mean, I tend to be, I tend to be pretty sensitive, but mass I'm hypersensitive. I pick up. So, um, cause of course, baby's crying. I mean, Jesus said, "Let the little children come to me." I mean, you can go in the crying room, right? But um, I wonder if I'm asking our Facebook family as well as both of you. Are you, are you? Uh, a hundred percent recollected or concentrating every different detail of the mass, probably not. But we should be aiming at it, right? Yeah, maybe not, but I think we should be aiming high because every gesture, prayer in the mass is charged with grace. Therefore, we're depriving ourselves of grace. And it's going to be more difficult to resist temptation if we're Depriving yourself of grace. I really, on this day of Holy Thursday, I really hope that the, the Mass becomes more and more central. And we do all we possibly can. That's why I insist all the people come, if possible. Try not to come late, but try to come a little bit early. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have to work and you got five kids, God understands. But, you know... Um, Eric, one of the reasons why athletes, baseball players or football players or basketball players, one of the, one of the reasons why they, they would pull a hamstring is one of the reasons why is they're not warmed up enough. Because you have to warm up. I remember years ago I was uh, listening to a baseball game. This is probably in the late 60s. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Gate Browns. He was one of the most muscular 
baseball players back in the 60s. He was, uh, he was on the Tigers, and the guy, he looked just like a plug, you know. And they were saying that a guy, guy like him has to warm up twice as much as the other because he had so much the muscle. Muscle mass. Yeah, so the muscle right. mass has to be set in gear, and we call it dispositive grace, don't we, in the Eucharist. So you're coming in, you're coming in late, very often you, you, you'll be distracted during the whole Mass. Do you remember the movie, The Great Miracle? Yes. Do you remember the scene when the man, woman comes in late with a mass, with a kid in a stroller, and the angel says, they don't get anything out of mass because they're not bringing anything in. Do <laughs> you right. remember that scene? That's right. Is they, they came in last, they weren't paying attention, and the angel says to what, to Monica or Kata, one of them, see that, Kalpo, they're not going to get anything out of mass because they're really not bringing anything to mass. Mm. Even one occasion, my mom was teaching confirmation in uh, in Massachusetts, and those were the times where they actually were very informal. They were te they had about four or five kids in their home, and I w I, th I think uh, I was just sitting in. I think I'd come back from Villanova, and I just was checking out the. They were good. Uh, they were really, they were good catechists. And there was uh, there was a uh, this teenage girl, very very arrogant. Um, conceded and she she looked at my mom and said mrs brome you know this mass stuff and these are they're going to be they're going to be confirmed you know this mass stuff uh i i don't get it i don't get anything out of mass and my mom i believe was inspired by the holy spirit said you don't get anything out of mass because you don't bring anything to mass You know, Eric, if I'm going to your birthday party, and I knock on the door, and you open them, and I say, the first thing I say is, where's the ice cream and cake? I mean, that would be rude. I mean, I might be thinking about that, you know, uh, as well as the pizza. But uh, <laughs> the first thing I do is I bring you a gift. Happy birthday. Yeah. Otherwise, we're talking, about, we're talking about church manners. You know, church manners, they should exist. There should be a good book written on church manners, right? Yes. At least a blog article, right, yes. Mary? Yes. So that's the, that's the phrase that has jumped out at me uh, on Sacrosanctic and Chilling, participating fully, actively, and consciously. And often I feel that many people participate partially, passively, and uh, subconsciously. Or comatose, <laughs> which there's, yeah. there's no participation. Particip and you, this positive grace, you're going to get what you put into it. Right. Any thoughts? It's a very important conversation. Uh, I think so. Very important. And I think the fact that, um, that you're, you know, here at St. Peter Chanel, people are being catechized about it is important. Mm -hmm. And... The whole thing about, um, you know, you, you talked before about what is the opposite of love isn't necessarily hatred, but it's indifference. Mm -hmm. And last night, I think it was, when Father Ed was t doing this talk at St. Therese, he was talking about it like he's set up a scenario where he, he comes over and to these people's house and they put him out in the garage with Pete the parakeet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked that. <laughs> but, but you know what, Father? I was thinking about what you said when you were just speaking, but if somebody is like texting while you're, you know, you, you come over to visit somebody or you're, you come to have a meal with a good friend and they're sitting there, that's painful. I would rather be out in the garage with Pete the parakeet <laughs> than having being there. It's it's even it's in your face. It's like it says you're not important to me. Mm -hmm. You you don't matter to me. You're you're low on my priority list. And mm -hmm. yeah. you know these uh, this you know th this you know that's you know or just like you said yawning or you can tell when people are zoning out. They're not making eye contact with you. And so that translates directly into what happens at the Mass. 
And uh, yeah, I'm guilty. At, you know, I'm definitely sometimes guilty. And I think that constantly being reminded uh, is, is really important, but also learning about what's really going on in the Mass. And you're teaching this class about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. It's highly, it's needed. People have to know what's going on and what the, what the basis of what's going on is. And like, there's so many good things, like you mentioned that movie, uh, The Greatest Miracle, which kind of portrays in an animated form what is happening in the Mass from, from visions from the mystics, what's really going on. Uh, there's a reality that is more real than what we can actually perceive with our seven senses that's taking place in the supernatural world. But also, Jesus Christ, God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God is perfect. And his attention is perfect. And with us, we may be distracted and may not know somebody else is being, you know, when we're talking to somebody, we may not even sometimes perceive that they're being distracted and not paying attention to us. But God doesn't. God, God, his, his, his attention is perfectly attuned to what we're doing in the Mass. And there's many things that, um, that, that I've learned about the Mass and um, just how important it is to be, um, to be participating fully, as you said. Um, and something that just came to mind, too, is uh, from one of my sharing groups in the last week, as we were talking about this, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, or it was a, one of the phone calls with one of the people that I had, but they mentioned something that I'd heard uh, uh, many times from you, Father Ed, about, you know, that come to this Mass, and this was, this was a, initially it was, a, it was a sign in the sacristy at, um, somewhere it said, priest, celebrate this Mass as if it were your first. first Last, your Mass Last, and your only Mass, and this man quoted that and told me how that basically just kind of was a whole new, uh, just a, a way to really look at this. And he was so inspired by that. And it's good to, for those things to come to mind <laughs> before we go to Mass, because it could be. This could be, and every time I, we go into Mass, every time I go to Mass, um, I've had health issues already. <laughs> My heart has stopped beating three times you know, several years ago, but it could be, this. That it, every Mass could be my opportunity for viaticum. This could be my food for the journey. And if I'm not recollected, it's just kind of like, it's, it's frightening to me that, um, that I would, you know, be, be distracted. So I think it's, and it isn't, it's not so much the fear, it's, what is that going to do to Jesus? And, and we, you were, we were talking earlier about how much he loves us and wants to be with us and how much he desires us. Why would we want to hurt him that way? Beautiful insight. Very beautiful insight. And what you're saying it is true. We, in the Ignatian Forum, we talk about many topics. We often talk about the four last things, which would be death, judgment, heaven and hell, and eternity. We, we don't know when we're going to be called. We live in very precarious times, and you know, n none of us have a perfect health. Even those, that ha those who have a very good health, you can never tell. Yeah. We, we hear stories of people that are in top physical condition, they keel over with a heart attack, or maybe a car accident in the freeway, you yeah, can never really tell. It could have been me. Well, it could be any, or we could all... We, we could all die at any moment, so we have to be prepared. I like the idea, and I've quoted that. I, I, that's actually, I think, in the Sacred Heart Retreat House, saying this Mass is it for your first Mass, last Mass, and only Mass. And I turn the table around and say, people, receive communion as if it were your first communion, your last communion, your only communion, communion which you're going to be judged for exactly. all eternity. That should be our attitude. Ne never to, Never to take... The Mass and the Eucharist for granted. If we had to walk like Juan Diego 11 miles to Mass and 11 miles back to Juan Bernardino, uh, I think we'd appreciate Mass much more. And the, um, and the absence of the Beloved, you appreciate the Beloved all the more when you, when you meet the Beloved, right? And our Lord is the Beloved of our hearts, right? 
So uh, yeah, we want to be grateful, appreciative, and as you're pointing out, uh, not to take it for granted. That whole idea of indifference, uh, I don't know about you, it really cuts me. Just a total apathetic, lackadaisical, nonchalant, flippant attitude toward the sacred. Um, it hurts me a lot, but how much, how much it must hurt the Lord? He said I'd come to cast fire on the earth. That's the exact opposite of fire, right? right. For me, it's, it's ashes. No? That's why I really believe the spiritual exercises is a remedy. I really believe it. If people do the spiritual exercise as well, that will move the indifferent to, to fervent, the fervent to even more fervent. And the, the very fervent to become saints. As I said to them yesterday, I offer the Mass, all you become saints. And that, I don't say that as a pious platitude or cliche, but I say it in all reality. Great discussion. So, um, there's only two books that I read daily, every single day. One is the Bible, because I use, you know, I, I do the scriptures of the Bible. And it may surprise you, but the second one is the Magnificat. Why the Magnificat? Because, and I've said this before, but it's, it's worth hearing again, worth saying again. 20 years ago, um, a saint taught me the secret of absolute participation in the Mass. Um, focused participation in the Mass. A saint taught me. That was Sister Ida Petrophy, Ida. Venerable mm -hmm. Ida Petrophy. And she was giving adult class to adults. My husband and I were there. And she said, the secret is to pray, exercise your um, uh, priesthood of the faithful the common priesthood of the faithful. We don't have holy orders, but we, we have the grace through baptism of the common priesthood of the faithful. And I pray every word of the Mass with the priest. Every word. And how do I do that? And with the lector, too. So some of it I read. So I know what the prefaces are, the common prefaces. I know which one Father Ed uses, and I go right to it, and I pray every word of it with him. Father Craig switches between two, and I listen to try to go which one. When he was doing it in Spanish, I had a really hard time, because I was trying to catch a few Spanish words, and I was flumming to find it. And I finally said, look, I'm not praying. You're just looking through your book. Stop. <laughs> okay. But that's why I, I prefer not bilingual because I want to pray every word and I want to know where it is and I want to find it and I want to pray it. So I prefer, for me, English Mass. The second thing is then the things that, that the priest prays that are not in here, I listen and I, as they, as they say it, I say it. You say, come Holy Spirit, I'm right behind you. Come Holy Spirit, just, just a second behind you. The minute you say the word, I think it. And I, and I pray every single thing you pray on the altar. I pray with you. Every single word the lector says, I pray. And I, when I started doing this um, here at Peter Chanel, when I was doing it here, and I remember when we had Mass in the church, and we did the liturgy, the hours first, and then we did Mass, and there were so many people in the church, that I would, I would, sit, I would be there praying the Mass, and afterwards someone would say, did you see what, so, what happened over there? This woman kind of fainted, and people were, were around her. I said, no. <laughs> no, I was totally unaware. Or... You know, they'll say, did you see so-and-so there? She hasn't been here for a long time. I said, no, I, I don't know who is there. I was so focused, I, I didn't know anything of who was around me or what was going on around me. And that's, that's still true, but it's, for me, I'm exercising my priesthood, my common priesthood. I am praying the Mass, and every part of it, and I give, that's my gift to Jesus, is I'm here with you on the altar. Father Ed said, that when, when he has the patent, place ourselves on the patent, on the altar, and that we, when, when you bless that and that becomes Christ, I, I am altar Christus. I am mini altar Christus. I am layperson altar Christus, not, 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 not ordination, but in my, in my common priesthood. And um, I really value that. That's the most magnificent part. The Mass is so magnificent to me because of that, and I wish everyone could could try it and just pray every word of it. It's so magnificent. It's so magnificent. Really every part of the Mass has so much value. And it's almost as if the 
the culminating point of Mass is communion, but the more you're participating in the intro, the penitential rite, we'll get into the Gloria once we arrive at Easter Sunday, and then we're listening attentively to the Word of God, the riches of the Word of God, almost as if this is like a, a crescendo in which you're disposing yourself to that intimate moment in which you receive Christ into the very depths of your heart. So the more that you are attentive in all the preceding elements of the Mass, the more efficacious the communion will be when you do receive Holy Communion. Eric, any thoughts? I think that's beautiful what you said, Mary. Uh, exercising uh, our responsibility as a member of the common priesthood of the faithful and that, you know, and it, it really, I think, blends well with your point, Father, that um, about participation in the Mass is more than just, you know, there's a, there's a response to that and to, for us that. to be responding. Yes. Mass. Yeah. Yes. And so that's a it's a great uh, a great way to approach it but that we have that part of it it is uh you know it's uh it's beautifully orchestrated and uh, i think it's something that um i think it should be exciting for for people that haven't done that is to discover that and i appreciate you saying that because i um i, I used to do that more is to be able to follow along and and all that, uh, but uh, it's there, it's the daily missile, that's what the Magnificat is. Some people have whatever it is, it could be you know, the hardbound daily missile, and people know that well enough they can use it, or there's other versions of it, but yeah, mine is right here. <laughs> but it's all there, and so we have that available to us and to take advantage of, of that. Just, just to interject what you're saying, even if they don't have anything, if they listen to the words and they just That's repeat right. it after, right. just it's just like a second after I'm repeating the word, I'm following through. That's another way to do it without having anything in your hand. Yeah. And for people that go to daily mass, they do see, they can see the nuances in the way the priests, um, they have flexibility in the way they celebrate the, the mass, which uh, Eucharistic prayers that they use and um, you know then you can get it's even more beautiful once you you can see the kind of how God is like as we pray individually so can the priest there's some latitude about what they talk about during the homily and there's all kinds of things that we can um, we can really tune into and to to learn the specifics of the mass in our own parish not just I mean the, the Catholic mass but also what's happening in our parish and how do our priests do this you know how do they how do they become that they op they operate in persona Christe when they're consecrating and in, as an altar Christus and we can be an altar Christus as well we we need to be we need to be another Christ so let's be perpetually thankful for this great gift and actually the the word Eucharist as many of us know it means thanksgiving so may the prayer of the psalmist today be our, our prayer. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy and endures forever. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The intercession of Mary and St. Joseph and God's angels and saints. May God bless you with a greater faith and love and devotion to the Eucharist. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.